Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bagley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bagley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now, here's your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Are you serious? Are you serious? What? Seven days until deep impact? No, 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 no. At least NASA says no. But now the numbers are changing again. Asteroid TC4, Asteroid 2012 TC4. Uh, do you remember when BP first brought this forward three, four months ago? He said, be careful. Because at that time, NASA's website was telling us the asteroid was going to come within 36,000 miles of the Earth. Which, folks, is dangerously close. But oh, you know what I'm saying? Especially when you realize your satellites that orbit the Earth are at 22,500 miles. But even though NASA was saying 36,000 miles, their, their meters, their, their readings were saying 4,200 miles. What? Then they came out later and put out the chart and said, look, it's coming within 0.1 LD which is 24,000 miles. And we've been kind of living with that number and trying to relax with it. Well, they've just come back. Reassessment, 5,400 miles. Plus, you've got that curvature. you got that bend. you got that gravitational pull. And so, wait a minute. Hold it a minute. Because there's a 15,000-mile um, play here. Give or take 15,000 miles for, you know, <laughs> give or take, we're only down to five. So there's a reason that every um, telescope and every observatory in the entire world has turned toward the asteroid. There's a reason that President Obama signed last year and made an executive order on how to deal with space weather events. There's a reason that Vladimir Putin has turned his nuclear rockets toward the asteroids. There's a reason that the federal government set up an Armageddon office in Washington. There, there's definitely a reason, and it may not be this asteroid necessarily, although this is dangerously, dangerously close, but certainly... Uh, the because of the galactical plane that we're in, the numbers of asteroids are increasing. The number of near, we had four asteroids go by the Earth yesterday, folks. Are you serious? Four of them. So I'm out here saying, okay, time out. We got to look at this. And oh, by the way, as I've been saying for months, this is the third sign of the apocalypse. And I, what I mean by that is, it's the third prophetic sign of this feast season. Certainly, all of them are. Uh, announcing to us, proclaiming to us that we're living in the end of the age and that we're entering into another era as the beast is certainly trying to build its momentum and get in position to rise. We're watching it. We had the uh, total eclipse of the sun, the solar, the, the great American eclipse, they call it, but it was certainly a warning for the United States. No question it was a, a warning for America and the world. And what's happened has been a North American phenomenon, if you quite be quite honest, raging wildfires, breaking wildfires in British Columbia, Canada, largest earthquake in Mexico's history, 8.2, excuse me, largest earthquake in Mexico in over 100 years of 8.2, killing 102 people. And then another earthquake in Mexico of 7.1, killing 369 people. And a, and a hurricane, Katia, hitting Mexico, and Hurricane Max hitting Mexico, killing two and one. And then there's Hurricane, I mean, what are you going to do with Hurricane Harvey killing a, a, a hundred and, I forgot the total number now, no, uh, killing 74. And then you have Hurricane, in Texas, 
record rain, 49 inches falling on Houston. And then you have Hurricane Irma hitting Florida. And by the time it got done smashing through the Caribbeans and tearing up Cuba and wiping out that little island of Babuda, uh, there was a hundred and, uh, there was 82 people killed in Irma. And then here comes Hurricane Maria just destroying Puerto Rico. The death toll now, I think, is at about 38 in Puerto Rico alone. And then, of course, there's Hurricane Jose, you know, and Hurricane Lee. And now we got Hurricane Nate. Well, it's not a hurricane yet, but it will be. And guess what, folks? It's headed right for the Gulf Coast on Sunday. Does anybody even know this yet? Are you serious? But anyway, look at, and then Kim Jong-un threatened to go boom, boom, boom. Three times he fired a, a missile over top Japan. Then he detonated a hydrogen bomb and set off a 6.3 earthquake. Then he fired another missile over Japan. He threatened to sink Japan. He threatened now yesterday to create a nuclear cloud over Japan. He's calling the prime minister of Japan Prime Minister Abe, he's calling him a headless chicken. He's threatening to turn America into ashes and the darkness. Folks, are you serious? So we had this. This is a sign in the heavens. There shall be signs in the earth. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and the stress of nations with perplexity. The sea, the waves roaring and men's hearts shall fail them for fear for looking after those things coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the sign of the son of man. Another scripture says, then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, he said, look up. Lift up your head. Your redemption's drawing nigh. The coming apocalypse. The coming revelation. The coming unveiling. The coming king. We're getting closer, folks. <coughs> Excuse me. We are definitely getting closer. Well, we got a lot to talk about here because the first sign of the apocalypse, we'll say, was the total solar eclipse. The second sign during this feast season was was no doubt September 23rd. It showed us the proclamation in the constellations, Revelation 12, completely just right there they were, perfectly set up. Yeah, it comes around about every 12 years, but never this perfect. And then we have the asteroid, asteroid 2012 TC4, which is now going to give us a very close shave all right now before we before we go any further let's go to the word of god now there's been questions to me pastor what about wormwood well wormwood's in the bible wormwood's going to happen there's going to be two deep impacts the the earth will get hit not tc4 probably although i would kind of be watching you know Probably not TC4 is going to hit us, but we're going to get hit. I mean, we just got hit in 2013 with that one in Russia, and this one's bigger than the one in Russia. You know, and last year, uh, Australia got hit with one, and, you know, fireballs are breaking through the Earth's atmosphere every day. So let's be honest, we're, uh, we're in this. And right now, you're in the, you know, you're in the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? So we're in the Feast of Tabernacles, and... We're, we're literally realizing that this feast season that we've been in has been filled with apocalyptic signs. And uh, at the conclusion of this feast season comes the asteroid. It's just quite remarkable. I think God is sending us plenty of prophetic messages. But let's go to the Bible because there will be a day that there will be wormwood. And some folks need to know what that is. And so we're going to go to the book of Revelation chapter uh, 8. And we're going to let Max read from the King James Version of the Bible. Max, Revelation chapter 8. Tell us about those two deep impacts and what this all means. Revelation 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, 
having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. What? And cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up. And all green grass was burnt up. Are you serious? And the second angel sounded. And as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. That is huge. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. Okay. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. Or bitter. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Poisonous. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon. And the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it. And the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. Saying with a loud voice. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Folks, it's just a uh, an amazing, an amazing, you know, it's just amazing scriptures to read when you read the book of Revelation. And remember, they're not all in chronological order, okay? But they are events that will eventually take place on the planet. Now, when the wrath of God is poured out, the saints of God won't be here. There's a difference between, uh, you know, the wrath of God and persecution and troubles and trials and, and uh, you know, all kinds of events, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, plagues, hailstorms. I mean, all of these things are things we are watching and we are seeing increasing. But the wrath of God is just that, the wrath of God. And that... The body of Christ will not be here for it, and thank God we won't. Matter of fact, even the dead in Christ will not be here for it, okay? So we will all be already caught up forever to be with the Lord, and so shall we be with the Lord. But the precursors to this, the events that lead up to this, is the era we're in now. I call it the age of the Antichrist, but certainly what it means is it's the end of the age. It's, it's the age of the apocalypse. It's the hour uh, that the world begins to reel and rock like a drunkard man, like uh, uh, the all of the different events start to uh, come together, cataclysmic situations start playing out in front of our very eyes, and the great falling away, because Jesus even said, you know, and and Paul said, except there come a falling away first, the end shall not come. Yet Jesus also said, when this gospel is preached into all the world, then shall the end come. So it's sort of like, okay, you don't get the end until they fall away, and you, and you get the end when the gospel's preached to it all. So in other words, the gospel's going to increase while there's a great falling away. It doesn't make sense to some people to say, wait a minute, if there's this great falling away, how are we going to have this great harvest? It's exactly how it's going to work. This is the separation, okay? The separation, the church of apostasy. There's the church of Laodicea riding right along with the church of Philadelphia. And they will separate, just like Jesus said, leave them alone right now. Let it all grow together because the, the, we're going to come and, the, and they're going to separate the tares from the wheat. We're going to separate the sheep from the goats. And so this is coming. So the great revival, the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the great harvest of souls, I believe has already begun, just like the beginning of sorrows has already begun. So you're starting to see both of these things ramping up. I mean, listen, folks, take this analogy. Kim Jong-un is ramping up for war right now. His people are in the streets 
chanting and shouting war, war, war. They're beating the war drums. They're feeling it everywhere. He's, he is building weapons as fast as he can. Meanwhile, the United States is moving our assets, upgrading our battleships, positioning our nuclear submarines, training our soldiers, preparing our B-2 and B-1 bombers and stealth bombers, getting our rocket launchers, our THAAD missile systems in place, monitoring where the Russians are, where are the Chinese, making sure the South Koreans are fully ready, helping the Japanese to get ready. Why? Because the confrontation is coming. And diplomatic communications has been severed. I mean, it just, it, it, look folks, it's coming. So if that goes on in the natural, good versus evil, let's say, what do you think is going to happen in the preparation to the battle of Armageddon? Christ is gathering his army. He's preparing his bride. He's raising up his folks. He's come bringing in his great harvest. We're getting strategically positioned. We're getting trained and put to the test. And so think it not strange uh, that when you are tried like gold is tried in the fire. This is not some strange fiery trial that's come upon you. But this is the conditioning of God the Father. Preparing you for the climax of the, of the cosmos. Preparing you for the coming uh, calamities and catastrophic cataclysmic conclusion to the coming of Christ. And let me tell you, as he prepares us, Satan, Lucifer is releasing every horde in hell and he's, he's whipping up the pagans and he's in fuel injecting with demon spirits, uh, the, the occultists and he's crying out to every evil demon he possesses because both sides are preparing for the great conference for the great battle of the end of the age. And so, in that preparation, things are happening. Whatever's going on in the spiritual world manifests in the physicals. Okay? So let me tell you some of the things that are going on right now before we get any further into this dialogue. But certainly, uh, oh, tonight, guys, tonight is the harvest moon. Uh, it is the harvest moon and we are in the feast of tabernacles. So think about this. Now the harvest moon is always the, 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 uh, full moon that is the closest to the autumn equinox. Okay. Yeah. And the moon actually could be, could turn red or could be ornish. Could be a little orange. Um, sometimes it's not scheduled to be a red, uh, to be a blood moon, but We've seen it before. Sometimes the harvest moon is just a bright, beautiful moon, no, no color. Um, and so in, in a lot of times, it's in different parts of the world. It may have different shades. It all depends what's going on in the atmosphere on the earth. But it is a harvest moon. It's tonight, okay? As the spring, or what's called the spring, or excuse me, the autumn equinox took place on September 22nd, on the eve of the September 23rd, uh, sign in the heavens. So the autumn equinox was on September 22nd. Tonight is a full moon. It is a harvest moon and it's also the feast of tabernacles. Okay. So keep those things in mind and, and praise God for that. We thank the Lord. A time of the, of course, also known as the feast of the booths. And, uh, I was in Israel a couple years ago during the Feast of Tabernacles and I observed how that city recognizes this feast by the Orthodox Jews, okay? Just, just kind of observing. And I noticed that there was a lot of little like, they put canvas, put little tarps. Look, you have to understand in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, People live in small apartments, okay, all over the city. They live in little small apartments, condos and apartments. And so they don't have much space. Small apartments might have a family of three or four, still small apartment. You got a little bit of a balcony on the outside there of your apartment. And you'll see people with chairs and plants and, you know, different. sometimes they're hanging their laundry out over the rail, you know, that kind of thing. But... And I'm talking in the Jewish communities now. And so when you go, when you go down into the Jewish, and I went down where the ascetic Jews are, okay, 
you know, some of the ultra orthodox Jews are. And when you go down in there, you'll see they, a lot of them bring out these little canvas and they have these little canvas where they create like a booth, like a tent. Okay. It's not a tent, but it's, they'll put it, they'll put a little canvas over the top. And here's why they do that. During the Feast of Tabernacles, some of them, uh, everybody follows the, this a little different. Some folks actually go and live inside a, a, a booth or a tent like Abraham for the entire Feast of Tabernacles. But not everybody can do that. Um, they don't have the space. They don't, you know, maybe their age, uh, you know. So what they do is they put the little tent, they put the little canvas out there and they go out there and they eat all their meals underneath that canvas as, as, a, as a way of worship, a way of respect, of what their forefathers, Abraham and Moses, especially with Moses coming, you know, out of, after the Exodus and how that they were, uh, what they had to go through and they, they're reflecting on that and they're thanking the Father, uh, they're thanking the Lord for bringing them out, okay? It's a great time for them. And there's some other traditions they have and, and they don't all do the exact same thing. So you keep that in mind, but it's, it's a very, very holy time. Okay, during the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, the first tabernacle was built by Moses. It was directed by God in your Bible exactly how to build it, how, how to make the size of it. And it was to be made out of certain uh, skins of animals and different colors. And there was one door. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And there was a place for the, the outer court for the sacrifice on the brazen altar and all these things. And that was the first tabernacle um, and uh, and that was how they first worshiped uh, in the wilderness and it was a movable it was a mobile tabernacle so they would set up camp set up the tabernacle and they might stay for a year two years in one place before they would move on it took them 40 years to get to uh, to the Jordan River to get to Canaan uh, they wandered around in the wilderness and they moved that tabernacle around with them each time they went before they finally crossed over into Canaan. Now we know that after a while, the tabernacle was no longer needed because Solomon was instructed by the Lord to build the temple, the what's known as the first temple or Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Okay. So there took some time before they got into that point, but certainly it's a, this is the feast of tabernacles and this is the time that uh, that is being observed and being reflected. It's really, really good, okay? I just thought I'd give you that. I've been blessed now to experience the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem to see how that is uh, observed and, and uh, worshipped. And then I've also been there during the Feast of Pentecost to see how, that, uh, is, how that's been observed by the uh, uh, Orthodox Jews and, and also Messianic Jews. Okay. So, um, and, uh, you know, when you see how the different feasts are being done, you realize that, uh, God's word, God's covenant, God's promise has never failed. It just continues as it was set out to be. All right. Having said all that, let me tell you what else is going on right now. The earthquakes, um, uh, we've had 19. It's a third day that's kind of quiet. And thank God for that. Only 19 earthquakes in the last 24 hours of 4.8 in the mid, and I'm talking of significance. Uh, certainly there's way more than that if you count all the little small ones all over the world. Okay. But a 4.8 in mid Indian Ridge, a 4.1 in Mexico, a 3.2 in Alaska. There we go again in blue, a 4.2 down in San Francisco, Mexico. That's where that killer quake just happened. Uh, 3.5 Oklahoma, 4.5 Chile, 3.4 Oklahoma, 2.6 Alaska, 2.6 Oklahoma. Look at that, Kodiak, right up there in Alaska in blue. Kodiak Station, Alaska, 4.3. We had a 2.7 in the geysers down there in California. We had a 2.5 in California, 5.4. This was the strongest quake of the day so far in the last 24 hours down there in Chile, 5.4, but it was 112 kilometers deep. There was a 4.5 in the Fiji Islands, 
Big Timber, Montana. Here we go again in the Yellowstone Danger Zone. There it is, 2.6 earthquake. And of course, Yellowstone wretched that uh, milestone of 2,500 earthquakes in the last, since June 12th, since June 12th. Also, 4.7 earthquake hit right there in blue, way over there in Iran. A 5.0 over here in the Philippines, back in the Ring of Fire, and a 2.7 in the geysers of California. All right? So that's the 19 quakes of significance around the world. And uh, the earth continues to shake and quake, and the devil's back continues to ache and break. All right? Um, solar winds, 412 kilometers per second. Little more than normal, but... Uh, Quiet because there's been no solar flares. We're in a solar minimum, and this is how the sun is supposed to act. That's why I'm so stunned by those two mega X-class solar flares we had during the 40-day warning because that shouldn't have happened. We were in a solar minimum, but I think we had it happen because God wanted to fulfill the prophecy. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, Okay. And there was distress of nations with confusion or perplexity. And yes, hurricanes, oh, the sea and the waves were roaring. I don't think you can get any more plainer than what we've saw and what we've seen taking place during this time of prophetic revelation. And oh, don't forget also, we did have 22 solar flares in the last uh, 20, excuse me, 22 fireballs in the last 24 hours taking place. But the asteroid, asteroid, asteroid 2012 TC4 is coming. It is going to approach the earth. It will definitely be a close shave. 0 0.1, that would be 24,000 miles. But we have a latest articles just out. NASA has revised and are saying it's going to come within 5,400 miles. And so I'm waiting to see uh, BP Earthwatch's analysis of this now, because what does this mean with the gravitational pull? And what if it's got companion asteroids behind it that we can't see? Because the one in front is leading the way. It's got the light. There could be some right behind it, even closer, but you just can't see it. Because, you know, it's such a distance and it's such a speed and, and they're being shelter behind the light. But anyway, there's an article out in, um, let me find it, on the asteroid. Um, and uh, October 12th, asteroid flyby, the path tracker of 2012 TC4 as it heads towards the Earth. According to the reports on next Thursday, October 12th, we're seven days left until asteroid 2012 TC4 will come very close to the Earth as it passes in between the moon and our planet just 4,200 miles away. So again, there's one report of 4,200 miles again. The map from NASA, though, shows that the 2012 TC4 will enter the space between the Earth and the moon's orbit digitally uh, diagonally from just north of east before it shoots back out into outer space. NASA will use extremely close flyby. Less than 5,400 miles is the distance between London and Los Angeles. This asteroid will be closer than that, as they're saying, to gather valuable data on the asteroid, which was discovered in 2012. Michael Kelly, program scientist and NASA headquarters lead for the TC4 observation campaign said scientists have always appreciated knowing when an asteroid will make a close approach to and safely pass by the earth because they can make preparations to collect data to characterize the, and learn as much as possible about the asteroids. The time we are adding in another layer of effort using asteroid flyby 
to test the worldwide asteroid detection and tracking network, assessing our capability to work together in response to finding a potential real asteroid threat. The path of the asteroid has been described as a close miss. What? By scientists, as the astronomical terms, it is just a hair's width away. Are you serious? Are you serious? And uh, the European Space Operations Center in Germany says it is very close. I won't use their exact term. The furthest satellite are 36,000 kilometers, or our satellites that go around the Earth are 22,400 miles. That's all the satellites that are circling and orbiting the Earth. This thing is coming in way closer than they are. And uh, as close as it is right now, I think the prediction is pretty safe, meaning it will miss us. But... Um, this thing is 10 to 30 meters in size. Actually, NASA says it's 16 meters. It's believed to be bigger than the one that hit in Russia back in February of 2013, which damaged thousands of buildings and injured 1,500 people. Now, that one, though, made its deep impact. It actually hit and landed in a frozen lake in Siberia, but just as, just as it enters the atmosphere, and when it went right over those cities in uh, Russia, you saw on, and it was captured on videotape, you guys saw just how powerful that thing was. So we're seven days away before close approach. We're seven days from what I believe is the third sign of the apocalypse because it's the third sign of this feast season uh, this year, which I think is so, so prophetic what God is showing us. There's no question about it. And uh, we just keep, you know, this is what Jesus said this was going to happen. He told us just to be ready. An hour you think not, the Son of Man will come. He even told us that when you see the heavens shaken, look at this. If you go over to Revelation, I mean, if you go over into Luke 21, he talks about these great signs and fearful sights. Okay. And that's in Revelation, I mean, excuse me, in Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, it says this in verse 11, it says, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now, Genesis chapter one, verse 14 told us that God made the sun, the moon and the stars for this would be one of its purposes. Genesis 1, 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons or signs, meaning prophetic signs, seasons, meaning divine appointments or feast days and for days and for years. So here we are in this season, this feast season. Here we are in it and we're getting three signs in the heavens. The total solar eclipse, the Revelation 12 constellation alignment, and the near-miss asteroid. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say other than God was certainly setting this season aside to give us a proclamation, and that's what the Revelation 12 sign is really saying. It's a proclamation that the beast is attempting to gather steam to make an, to rise. It's, it's trying to pull it together. It's, I don't know how long that will take it to do that, but it, certainly we're in a different era. We've moved, look, look, the earth's been here a long time. Mankind's been around a long time. This is the year 5778 on the Hebrew calendar. So we've just entered into a new season. And that season is the soon preparation for the coming of the Lord. You know, I was on the phone with, uh, talking yesterday, I had a great conversation with Carl Gallup's. He and I were talking about uh, these, these very issues right here, and, and uh, he agreed with me. He said, there's no question. I mean, just no question. The proclamation was proclaimed. You know, I mean, the Word of God is telling us, and look at all the things that are happening. I mean, God is trying His best to get our attention, that uh, we're moving into the, to this age. Uh, you know, I think Irvin Baxter calls it the um, 
uh, what's the, the end of the age. I think he uses that term, the end of the age. In other words, the last days, okay? And, uh, you know, so we're in the era of the apocalypse. We're in the age of the Antichrist. We're in the last days. And the signs are matching up with the events that are on the ground. So certainly we're living in a time that we never thought we would ever see, to be quite honest. Uh, but it's here. I want to welcome all 1,027 of you. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. This is the day the Lord has made. He said, let's rejoice, be glad therein. It is the Feast of Tabernacles is going on. And yes, the signs are in the heavens. And so... Uh, it's really uh, it's really fascinating to see these events taking place, and it's exciting to know you're living. You're the fig tree generation that you're actually living when Israel has become a nation. <laughs> I mean, are you serious? You're li Israel's a nation, and it's been a nation almost seventy years. So you're in the. I mean, you're living in this day. The eagle is mounting its wings to fly along with Israel. And you know, that's why today, I did a video today. It's really, really, I think it's really good to listen to it on, uh, I read the book of Daniel chapter 7. I just read the whole chapter and did a little bit of commentary on it. It's so, it tells you about the four uh, kingdoms, four different kingdoms that rise in the earth. Three, and then the final one is more dreadful and more powerful than the other three. It's the fourth kingdom, or it is the beast system. It's the beast kingdom. And as it gets ready to rise, there is a very significant the events that will be taking place. Daniel saw this. He describes it, and it literally matches what John sees in Revelation 12 and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 and just on, you know, okay. So we're, we're seeing uh, an era begin. Now, as I've said many times before, the church also has entered into a new season. So the world's moved into a new season, but so have we. We've moved into the season of empowerment. We've moved into the season of the double blessing, the double portion. We've moved into the season of the outpouring. We're, you know, look, the early church, uh, you know, wow. But the Latter-day Church, wow, wow, okay? Because it's the climax, it's the conclusion, it's the coming of Christ. And uh, so we've entered into this era of the blessing, entered into the era of the Great Commission, entered into to the era of the Great Harvest, entered into the era of the Great Confrontation. And yes, <coughs> we will be hated, excuse me, and we are hated, we will be persecuted, that is already happening on different levels around the globe, but we are the victors. And we know that this fourth kingdom wants to wear out the saints. We know he wants to shut us down, but we prevail. We possess the land. We take ground. We lead people to Christ in power and great glory. And God blesses your family, blesses your home and your friends, your neighborhood. You are the light of the world. Jesus said, when I was in the world, he was the light of the world. But he said, now ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And so neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. No, you, when you light a candle, it's to give light to all that are in the house. All right. We're not secret disciples. We're the body of Christ. We're the, we're the head and not the tail. And we shall prevail. Can somebody say amen? Um, while this is going on, guys, I wanted to give you some more information. Yellowstone, the danger zone, 2,500 earthquakes. And since June the 12th, Newsweek did an article, um, came out yesterday. It says the ongoing earthquake swarm in Yellowstone National Park super volcano is now the longest ever recorded, having started on June 12th. Over the past three and a half months, there's been almost 2,500 earthquakes have been recorded in the western part of the National Park. This puts it on a par with the biggest swarm ever recorded, um, which was more than 3,000 earthquakes that took place over a three-month period back in 1985. Uh, the swarm is in no way signaling an impending eruption although I disagree with that assessment because I heard a climatologist 
give a speech earlier this year, back in uh, July down in Florida, in which and he worked with Jacques Cousteau, and he said he was a climatologist. He'd been doing this for 30 some years. He said, look, it's not a question of whether the super volcano at Yellowstone is going to erupt. He said, it's going to erupt. That's not a question. It's erupted three times in the history of the millenniums. But he said, this thing is going to blow. It's going to blow, he said. Just the question is, when? Is it within, is it 200 years or 200 days? It's definitely shaking up there. It's definitely, the activity is going. Um, so having said that, uh, we'll keep a close eye on it. It's the, uh, I was actually last, it's funny, this came out because last night I was watching the Weather Channel uh, just for a few minutes and they were doing a special on the super volcano in Yellowstone. And they said, this is the most volatile super volcano in the entire world. This is the most dangerous area in the world, yet it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful places on earth. But the magma and the, and the, and the lava is definitely, the pressure is definitely building. How long does this go? I don't know. But we know God knows, all right? So we'll keep a close eye on Yellowstone. Guys, we do have some information, though, of, of, of very sad nage, nature. Uh, three of our soldiers, uh, three U.S. soldiers were killed uh, and two others were injured in a horrific situation. They were training some Nigerian soldiers and they were attacked. And this happened, um, this happened actually in Niger. Uh, and uh, three U.S. soldiers are dead. Two more are injured in a, an attack on them. All they were doing was just out having a training session when they were attacked. Now the question is, were they set up? Uh, you know, who... They were special forces, right? Okay. So, you know, on, thank you, Brock. They were, it says in the article they were training and they may have been training others to be special forces or then again, you know, maybe they were on special assignment as well. But this is really, uh, they were set up. Okay. They were set up and, uh, three, three of our, uh, finest lost their lives. And so we pray for their families and pray for, uh, their, uh, those that are injured as well that they may be healed and make a quick recovery. Uh, the world is filled with violence, folks. It's a dangerous place. And uh, our hearts go out to the families of those that have paid the greatest sacrifice that anyone can pay to give their life up, that there could be safety and freedom and hope. And that's a very dangerous part of the world anyway there in Niger. Um, King Salman, Saudi King, King Salman, uh, visited Russia yesterday, he arrived in Moscow. I think he might even still be there. King Salman visiting Moscow and President Vladimir Putin. Uh, they were discussing oil and they were discussing Syria. And I think they go hand in hand, don't you? So in other words, because Putin is in Syria and he's not leaving. Matter of fact, he remember he signed that, that he's staying at least... 50 more years. I told you when Putin entered into Syria, he would never leave. And he brought the Iranians with him. So this is really strange because Putin and Iran are close allies. Yet Saudi, the Saudi king went to Moscow to meet with Putin. And the Saudi Arabians and the Iranians, Saudi Arabia and, and Iran are arch, arch, arch enemies. Because the Saudis are Sunni Muslims and the Iranians are Shiite Muslims and they do not agree at all. They hate each other. They've threatened each other. And uh, quite honestly, they're in conflict with each other. Even as we speak over in Yemen, there's a proxy war going on right now, folks, where the Houthi rebels are actually fighting Saudi Arabia. They're near the border. And uh, the Houthi rebels are funded completely by the Iranians. So there you go. King Salman visits Vladimir Putin in Russia, discussing the oil, discussing Syria, discussing relationships between those two nations. Um, 
We'll wait and see what comes out of that discussion. That should be interesting. But that went along. That was happening. And oh, by the way, in Spain, Catalonia has declared their independence. Catalonia has declared their independence. They're out of there. Well, we'll see if they are totally. Um, there you're looking at their, the, the, in Spain, I believe that's the prime minister of Spain, Mourinho Rejoy. Uh, he, he is now offering the Catalonians an offer to come back to the table and let's put together a multi-talk party talk about guys don't leave stay in Spain we'll cut the taxes way down we'll give you more power in the government there's the Brock put it out there that's Spain and you can see the region of Spain that's leaving and uh, it is the most wealthiest region of all of Spain it's called Catalonia and that's also where Barcelona is there's seven and a half million people live in that region. And uh, the folks there are tired of the excessive high taxes and, and not enough voice in the government. And so they're just saying, why, why are we doing this? You know, why are we doing this? Let's just declare our independence. And there's the, that's their new flag that they have. And they're putting away the Spanish flag. They are declaring their independence. And now let's see how this plays out. Will they, will, will Spain go in and arrest the leaders? They've elected a president or they've chosen a president. Their leader is Carl's, uh, Pugenmont or Pugenmont. He is now the president of Catalonia. And now that's not been recognized by the world. It's not been recognized by any government in the world, the United Nations. Nobody has, recognize them as a country yet but they've declared that they are uh he said i'm not afraid of being arrested for organizing this uh banned referendum they say look we wanted to vote whether we should stay in spain or not and the government of spain wouldn't let us hold it exactly the way we wanted to they sent in troops they they arrested people. They shot 900 people with rubber bullets. They beat people over the head with batons. But we voted anyway. They broke into our voting centers. They stole some of the ballots. They did all kinds of stuff to us. But we did it anyway. And we've decided we have declared our independence. We're leaving Spain. We're done. We're forming our own country, Catalonia. And uh, this is huge, folks. But this is part of the EU falling apart. I mean, Spain is broke, busted, and disgusted as a nation. They're $2 trillion in debt to the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. And they have no way of paying it. They can't, they're, they can't raise enough taxes to pay off the interest plus maintain their nation. So, and the, the, the area that had the most wealth and we're paying the high outrageous taxes was Catalonia and the Catalonian people said look we're working overtime we're working double shifts we're paying taxes of over 55 percent are you serious we can't I mean why should we do this we can't keep doing this it's ludicrous we're out we're just going to form our own government We'll collect our own taxes. We'll form our own government. Of course, that's not easy, folks. You've got to put a government together. You've got to put a military together. You've got to figure out how you're going to pull that all together. But they say, look, we've got a better chance of doing that ourselves than giving it all to, to uh, Madrid. And then Madrid takes it and just gives it all to the EU. But what this does to the EU is this. Now you can kiss that $2 trillion goodbye. And, and then you've got to deal with the, the debt of Greece and the debt of Portugal, and the debt of Italy, and the debt of a couple more states, and the, and oh, and then British have Brexit out of there. So the, all of a sudden, the weight falls on the back of the Germans and the French, and they're saying, "Are you serious? We're already in trouble." And then you got a migrant crisis that they can't afford. 
And then you got the Russians setting up troops all along the border of the NATO countries. And if you look at America, they're saying, Trump's saying, pay your own bills. You know, matter of fact, pay your fair share into NATO and pay your fair share into the UN. We're tired of paying everybody else's bills. We got, we're $21 trillion in debt. Now in comparison, America 21 trillion in debt is not as bad as Spain 2 trillion because of the economies. It's just, it's, they're way out of balance. We're out of balance. Okay. And if we don't get it together, we'll be way out of balance. And so getting it together is not easy. That's definitely not easy. So especially when you've been hit with three category four hurricanes and, uh, and you got the swamp draining every nickel that goes in there. And now you got to invest in, you got to fix Texas. You got to fix Florida. You got to rebuild Puerto Rico and you got to rebuild your military because the threats are dangerous out there. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh very, 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 uh, uh, tedious how this thing plays out around the world. But, um, that's where we're at. Uh, it's, it's really, really, and you know, and I, and I really, really have to say that the media with the Rex Tillerson thing, trying to, you know, put division between the president of the United States and the secretary of state. I mean, come on. I mean, again, and Trump, yeah, yes, we already know that Trump is labeled CNN fake news. Yes, 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 Brock. Yes, you're right. But what about MSNBC? What about NBC? Yesterday, the president said NBC that was a fake story about uh, uh, Rex Tillerson, and you guys are fake news. So now he's labeled NBC fake news, fake news. So they're not liking it. They're pushing back. They're trashing them. Uh, I was watching this morning on Morning Joke. I'm at Morning Joe. Uh, the Morning Joke, they spent three hours. I didn't watch all three hours, but each time I would go back there, I'd go to Fox for a little bit and, you know, watch a little bit over here and there this morning. For about 45 minutes there, I was just kind of bouncing back and forth between uh, Morning Joe at MSNBC and Fox News. I didn't even go. I didn't want to deal with CNN. I didn't even look their way. And uh, and I just and all I could see was this: Fox News was trying to tell everybody about the victims and Vegas and how that the investigation is still going on. How they don't see how this one guy did it all. He had to have had help. And they were still over in Vegas and talking to family members and bragging on the, the police and the first responders and the hospital and the nurses and the doctors. And Fox was trying to get the story of what America is, is really interested in. And I'd go back over to MSNBC and it was fake news. It was Trump and, and Tillerson and Tillerson was going to resign and, and uh, Mike Pence had to talk him into staying and Ivanka Trump and her condos and, and uh, Trump and Trump and, and Rex Tillerson and then the Russia probe. They want to talk about Russia. Probe. Who cares about the Russia probe? I mean, are you serious? Are you serious, dude? Are you serious? Who cares about the Russia thing? That's, it's, there's nothing there in the first place. You got... Kim Jong-un threatening to nuke people. You've got the worst mass shooting in American history. You've got Puerto Rico literally devastated. You're still trying to fix Texas and fix Florida. And is anybody going to ever fix Obamacare? And then what about the taxes? Are we ever going to get that? No. Where's Mitch McConnell? He's slower than a turtle. I mean, what's going on in the slippery, slimy, sleazy slope of Washington? I mean, are you serious, folks? And all these guys, they think there's something. The NBC people, the, 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 the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, all these guys, fake news media, CNN, all of them, they all think they're relevant. They all think that they're the authority of what should be discussed and what should be the prominent uh, story of the day. And they were poking fun and they actually were making fun of uh, Alex Jones, even this morning, they even laughed. One guy started laughing, he said he's a joke. And he said, you want to talk about fake news? And then they, you know, and so I thought to myself, you guys are, no wonder your numbers are falling. No wonder your numbers are falling. You're tanking dudes. You guys are tanking while everybody over here in, in the, uh, alternative media, we continue to grow. 
you continue to die and print media is a dinosaur. And the reason is everything they do is to tear down this country, to bring division in this country. They're so diverse, di uh, dis divisive. They're so wicked. They're so arrogant and pompous. And the American people are sick of it. Seriously, we are very sick of it. Okay? It is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And so, uh, I don't want to get on a rant here, but I'm just saying. You know, look, Alec Jones ain't perfect. All right? And neither am I, or neither is anybody else, or you, for that matter. Okay? But look at the big picture. I always say to people, because, you know, some people time, sometimes people get hung up on one thing. They like, they like you got somebody who's doing something. It's like there's a, a great oh, a message. Uh, one of the great preachers of all time, let's say, preaches a tremendous message, like, you know, and, uh, and, and is doing great work for the Lord. But might have made a mistake, might have made, uh, may, had a view or thought, or thought maybe this is the way this is, and they're, and they're wrong, okay? They just, they didn't get it right. Most people feel like, yeah, they probably got that wrong. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't just decide, well, forget it. I, I, that, that person, they, you know, that, the, I, I know one thing they messed up. Well, yeah, well, how many things have I messed up? How many things have you messed up? You just don't throw people overboard over one area or two areas or something you don't quite agree with. And I thank God that people in this, this is why I like about uh, this online church, this is why I like about you folks, is you have enough common sense, enough reasoning to say, Hey, look, we're all, we're all sinners saved by grace. We're all in this together and we got to work together. We got to pull together. We may not always agree on everything, but we believe in the cross. We still believe in the blood of Jesus. We still believe he, Yeshua is our Messiah. We're still looking for the coming King. We're still about the father's business. We're still trying to reach the lost. We still have faith in divine healing. We still believe that God can answer our prayers. And we're going to work together because we know our time is short. We're going to occupy till the king comes back. And we're going to stay focused and go forward and tear down the kingdom of darkness and shatter the darkness in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Uh, so anyway, it's just amazing to me uh, how... Uh, how that all plays out. But again, trying to destroy the Trump presidency, trying to destroy America, trying to destroy Christianity. This is partly what the left wing, left leaning, lamestream, mainstream, fake news media. This is what they're about. They have an agenda. They can, they cannot stand the truth. It doesn't matter. They hate the truth. They hate the name of Jesus. They hate Bible believing, Bible thumping, deplorables. They can't stand you folks clinging to your God and your guns. It just drives them nuts. You're deplorable. Okay? And, um, and they hate Jesus. I mean, it just drives them insane when you bring up the name of Jesus. Just, just about, they just about lose. Their fangs come out. Their scales start showing. Their reptilian eyes start darting whenever you start bringing up the name of Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm going to be right back in a couple minutes. Hour number two. We're going to deal. We're going to dig in on this threat with North Korea now. There's a CIA report that just came out that October 9th, we may have a major provocation by North Korea or even an attack. I'll be right back, folks. Give me just about three or four minutes with hour number two on the coming apocalypse. Are you serious? I have a brand new DVD entitled The Total Eclipse of the Sun. I mean, we have these great solar eclipses, the constellations in the heavens of Revelation 12, and many other signs that God gives in the last days. I have this DVD available at my website only. It's a powerful presentation of the coming of Jesus Christ and everything you need to know about his return. Get it now at my website. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousand Available from Paul Begley, his CD, Wayfaring Stranger. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. 
Traveling through This will world be Wayfaring Stranger includes the title cut plus 11 other songs. No Order yours by visiting paulbegleyprophecy.com today. And yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Folks, let me tell you something. I have a book I really recommend you should get. You go to my website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. I have a book entitled The Zombie Apocalypse. Now it has to do with actual, 35 actual accounts of demonic possession and manifestations that uh, is very troubling but will help you understand how demon spirits actually work in these last days. I highly recommend you get it also for your teens and college students to help explain to them the pitfalls to not fall into these uh, sorcery or witchcraft seances, Ouija boards or some video games that could alter the mind and the soul of your child. Again, this book, it's only at my website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. There you'll find it on the products page. It'll be a blessing to you, insightful, and you'll bless the ministry. A teacher who travels globally and has a genuine love for people. Your pastor. A brand new DVD, Rapture Ready. Finally, we're going to answer the question. Millions of people want to know, what is the rapture? When is the rapture? And am I ready for the rapture? Well, this brand new DVD is filled with information, scripture, a PowerPoint presentation that will help you prepare to be rapture ready. We're living in those days. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Get this DVD now at my website. One moment, everybody. We're coming in here. No question about it. We are living in the last days. Uh, we also, before we get into Kim Jong Un, before we get into Kim Jong Un here, we want to. Uh, sorry about that. We want to also take a look at this Hurricane Nate. And matter of fact, I'm going to check and see if we've got a, an updated report from BP Earthwatch. See if he has a uh, update for us. I want to welcome all of you that are listening over at Blog Talk Radio. And you know, at any time that you're not home and you just want to listen on the phone and you just and you just want to, you don't have a smartphone or you you would just want to listen, you could just dial the number th uh, three three two what is it three four seven three two four fifty two zero eight. That's three four seven three two four fifty two zero eight. Okay, and uh, you can listen on uh, Blog Talk Radio, or if you get the Public Prophecy app, you can. There's the, That's what the storm's looking like right now. That's Tropical Depression Nate, and he will become a, a hurricane. He will become a hurricane and will hit the Gulf states in the next 24 hours, excuse me, on Sunday. It will, he will become a hurricane and then hit, um, hit the Gulf states by Sunday. As you can see the path that Brock has up there for you, that is the path and it's going right for New Orleans. Uh, or just maybe it might take a right hook there and the eye may not hit New Orleans, but instead hit parts of Louisiana and Mississippi down there in the Gulf. Now, I'm going to uh, take a look real quick as, he's, uh, as Brock is showing you the path and keeping you up to speed on that. And I'm going to take a real quick peek over here and see if we have an updated report on this from BP Earthwatch. He did one. He had one yesterday. We played that on our show last night just to kind of get up to speed. And uh, let's see if he has something for us. So hang on just a second here. Um, and we'll be able to see what we got. Looks like he does. Um, that might be the same one from yesterday. Let's just see if it is. Uh, yeah, it's the same one from last night. Um, we'll give you a little bit of it, okay? We, we were hoping we were out of the October the 4th, 2017. 
You're looking at the five-day graphical or weather outlook from the National Hurricane Center, guys. We've got Tropical Depression 16. It's uh, 35 miles per hour. It's moving northwest at 7 miles an hour. This thing is expected to become Tropical Storm Nate by this afternoon. I'll update it then. Also, we have disturbance number one. Now, the thing about it, 0% chance of formation in five days. says, although significant tropical development of this system is still not expected due to stronger upper-level winds, brief squalls could likely produce local heavy rainfall and strong and gusty wind. Now, the thing about it, we'll look at that closer, There's is that, that map. it may come in the same place that this storm is. It's about to be Tropical Storm Nate this afternoon, continue to be a tropical storm. We hope it stays a tropical storm that long. But a hurricane by 8 a.m. Sunday. This is Wednesday evening, guys. 8 a.m. Sunday. Now, remember, this is the size of the... Uh, tracking uh, area, the cone, not the size of the storm. And it's showing its center coming up uh, in the Florida Panhandle. But none of the models match that, not one single uh, spaghetti model. We'll look at it. Uh, notice off the tip of South Florida, this is disturbance number one. Notice the wind is moving from right to left across the Gulf of Mexico or from east to west. That's what's going to pick that storm up. Now here is, uh, again, what they're saying will be Tropical Storm Nate by the next update. And you can see it's got full rotation and the it's controlling all the environment in this area. If it goes up uh, through the uh, peninsula that's uh, between the Yucatan and Canada, guys, that will, if the eye makes it through there, it will have less uh, deterioration over the islands. We're just going to have to watch it and see. But you got a pretty good storm there setting off of Florida. So we got to watch it because if we look at the models and you see the wind is moving there, that is going to pull this storm a little to the left away from the National Hurricane Center map that shows it coming into there. And it's going to pull disturbance number one over into the Gulf into the same area. And let's, we'll look at some of the models on it again. Just, this is going to be a brief update. We'll get a little more detail as we get more information. But if you notice, there it this is. is every model. There's the spaghetti model right there. Matter of fact, I'm going to enlarge it just for a second, and then, then I'll put it back. But that, I think, there it is. That is the spaghetti model that I wanted to talk about. And I'll put it back down smaller in a moment. But check this out. That's the, it's Cancun. Cancun, Mexico is that tip right there on the, Yuka, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, right there on the tip. That is Cancun. This hurricane, this at least tropical depression is going to hit Cancun. But once it gets into the Gulf waters, where it's 85 to 86 degrees right now, and I checked the waters, that's, that's warm, especially for first week of October. That's really warm. This storm will gather and collect itself and it will become a hurricane. And uh, now they're hoping it doesn't get any bigger than a Category 1, but it has a, a, a possibility even of a Category 2. The problem is even if it's a Category 1, if you look at the spaghetti models, it goes right in there. It looks like it's going to miss New Orleans. It's going to hang to the right and miss New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is going to get a ton of rain. Don't worry, they're going to get a ton of rain and wind and storm surge. But it, it looks like it's more going to go over here, catch the Louisiana and the Mississippi coast. But it may continue to hang even more right. But the, as you can see there, the spaghetti models are showing it going right in there to the coast of Louisiana and Mississippi. And so our prayers are definitely going out to everybody, though, in the Gulf states. Florida Panhandle, Alabama coast. The, uh, the Mississippi coast, the Louisiana coast. Shows it coming in either over New Orleans or into South Mississippi. One model has it coming to the uh, Mississippi-Alabama line, but most of them are wrapped up. And the Canadian model shows the eye wall to the right would be, or the right of the eye wall would be going right over Lake Pontchartrain, guys. Now, it, the key here is that it possibly will be a weak Category 1. The waters in the Gulf are still warm. It's that time of the year. We're still in hurricane season. But that's showing the entire track much further to the left. This is the global forecast system model. It's 
the amount of precipitable water, and the mean sea level pressure. This one, again, is agreeing with all the models coming in just in the south tip of Louisiana there in the right eye wall, the right side of the eye wall, or the, what would be called the northeast quadrant, is the worst, and it's coming right over Lake Pontchartrain right in there, which includes New Orleans. We, we were hoping we were out of the tropical season, but they were predicting these Caribbean storms in October for the last month on the extended models. And then it shows the storm coming in there, rolling over Mississippi and out into the Atlantic. But it So there you got most of it right there. And that's, that's the spaghetti models. That's the uh, weather forecast. And, of course, that was from 20 hours ago. I'm sure BP will update later today where we're at. And at the same time... I have an updated info, uh, and I'll show you that uh, right now. Tropical Storm Nate is predicted to hit the U.S. coast as a hurricane on Sunday. Again, let's hope that BP's right, that it's no more than a Category 1. But that is the path going right up there, just to the right of New Orleans. Uh, this tropical cyclone in the northwestern Caribbean Sea has been upgraded to a named storm, Tropical Storm Nate. The system is likely to become a hurricane in the next three days and could hit northern coast, Gulf Coast on Sunday morning as a hurricane. Residents along the Gulf Coast from Louisiana through the Florida Panhandle should monitor the progress of this system and heed any advice given by local officials, according to the National Hurricane Center. Nate is expected to strengthen as it moves over warmer waters on its way to the United States coast. But at this point, the National Hurricane Center says it is too early to specify the timing or the location or the magnitude of the impact. Now, Nate is currently bringing heavy rainfall to Nicaragua and Honduras as it scrapes along their coast on the northwest track toward Cancun, Mexico. The storm has triggered flood warnings in those areas, along with hurricane watch in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, so there you see it. I mean, it just it's working its way right on the path that most of the spaghetti models have been saying. And it looks like it's headed right for the uh, tip of Louisiana there. And so uh, the cyclone is currently has maximum sustained winds of 40, but of course it will build up to 75 miles an hour and higher, becoming a, a category one or higher hurricane. So that's where we're at on that. We're going to keep a close eye on uh, the hurricane uh, watch for the Gulf Coast. We're concerned and we're praying for all of uh, everybody down there because, again, America doesn't need a fourth hurricane. We just don't need it. But, again, uh, that's the situation. Uh, meanwhile, I want you to beware of something, and that is Kim Jong-un is, uh, there's, there's reports out that Kim Jong-un is threatening Japan for sure, but October 9th, a CIA operative, a CIA operative down in Seoul, South Korea, was actually uh, brought up to George Washington University yesterday and was speaking in a, con a conference. And at this conference, he declared to beware of October 9th. Beware of October 9th. It is Columbus Day. And it's also the uh, anniversary of the Workers' Party in North Korea that was founded in 1945 when North Korea uh, was, you know, putting this whole thing together about this communist regime. And so because of that anniversary, it's, and because it's an American uh, holiday, uh, the CIA guy said, I'm telling you, beware. Kim Jong-un is going to do something. Maybe he fires another missile over Japan. Maybe he detonates another hydrogen bomb. Or maybe he attacks somebody. It's just high, high, high uh, watch and be aware. October 9th, beware is, is uh, the words from the uh, CIA operative from South Korea. Now, meanwhile, Kim Jong-un made 
inflammatory comments uh, and called, he said, Kim Jong-un warns of a nuclear clouds over suicidal Japan's heads. And he also says that Japan's Prime Minister Abe looks like a headless chicken. Uh, according to reports, Kim Jong-un told state media there he ripped into Prime Minister Abe of Japan, accusing him of running around the United Nations stage like a headless chicken and pushing the region into a nuclear war. Uh, what? Japan's such rackets in the, in, are inciting the tension, he said, of the Korean Peninsula. It's a suicidal deed, and it will bring nuclear clouds to the Japanese people. No one knows when this touch-and-go situation will lead to a nuclear war, but if so, the Japanese Prime Minister and the Japanese people will be engulfed in flames in a moment. Now, in August, Kim Jong-un's military fired that Hassang-12 missile over Japan in a move that Prime Minister Abe called unprecedented threat to his country. The rocket flew 1,700 miles, soaring over the northern islands of Japan and crashing into the Pacific Ocean some 700 miles beyond the coast. Millions of Japanese were awoken in their beds by a text message on their phone urging them to seek cover immediately as a nightmare was unfolding. Loudspeakers started broadcasting the news in the streets and the railway stations while television stations and radio stations were issuing the warnings. Imagine that. A whole nation, alert, alert, hit the deck. Get down. There's a nuclear missile going over your heads. I mean, this is unbelievable, really. Uh, it was feared to be the secret of state's first test fire of a missile capable of carrying a nuclear weapon. And North Korea has conducted a flurry of missile tests recently and growing international unease. But U.S. President Donald J. Trump has threatened the state uh, of North Korea with, quote, fire and fury and pledged to totally destroy the country of North Korea if he is forced to defend itself or its allies, including Japan. So what happens now? Kim Jong-un says, look, you're going to have a nuclear cloud over your head. And he has said that uh, Trump has said that all options are on the table, including military action. And they remain on the table for reining in Kim Jong-un's nuclear ambitions. However, the threat to, to do not seem to worry the North Korean uh, people or their leader who calls the missile aimed at Japan just a curtain raiser. And after Japan's attack, uh, North Korea said the current ballistic rocket launching drill like a real war is the first step of a military operation of Korea's People's Army in the Pacific and a meaningful prelude to containing Guam. So now he's threatening Guam. The fiery outburst came at the United Nations Security Council, which includes Russia, Kim Jong-un's key ally, China, unanimously condemned this outrageous launch and a forceful UN statement agreed in the earlier hours of this morning saw China fall in line with the United States and Europe in condemning Kim Jong-un's latest act of saber-rattling. And it accused the regime of undermining regional peace and stability. South Korea retaliated by threatening to exterminate Kim Jong-un as it bombed the North Korean border in a show of overwhelming force. And F-15 fighter jets from the South Koreans dropped eight MK-84 bombs on targets at a military field. South Korea's president, Moon Jae, ordered the show of overwhelming force against North Korea as he admitted UN sanctions on North Korea are failing to keep the, the North Koreans in line. All right? 
So, I mean, it's getting uglier. Guys, war is coming. South Asian Armageddon is coming. That's all there is to it. It's coming. Uh, and, and, and I don't like it. I don't want it. It is time to pray. Thank you, Brock. It is flat out time to pray. Russia's moving tro troops in there. The U.S. have got uh, battleships, nuclear subs, um, B-1, B-2, stealth bombers everywhere, F-15s, F-35s, THAAD missile defense systems, rocket launchers, nuclear weapons, everything you can imagine. And the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Chinese, the Russians, I mean, the North Korean. This is dangerous. But, uh, oh, guess what? And there's a report out that the North Korean people are feeling the drums of war. And they're joining in. They're marching in the streets. They're chanting death to America. They're waving their flags. They're, they're, they're literally, they're teaching the children, they're preparing the kids. Everybody's getting ready for the military uh, confrontation with the United States. Uh, it is really, really very dangerous time we're in. They also, there was a, a study done. Look at that nuke right there going off. There's a study done uh, that tried to estimate what kind of damage would North Korea do if they believe that North Korea has 25 nuclear bombs? And they, they said to themselves, what if Kim Jong-un actually fired them all and he fired them at Seoul, South Korea and at Tokyo, Japan? How many people they estimate would die? And their estimate is somewhere between one and four million people because uh, they don't believe every nuke would get to its target. Some would get shot down, they think. Not all of them, though. And then um, this is their estimate of initial, the initial estimate. Uh, you've got the Winter Olympics coming in February of 2018. Uh, think about that. What are you going to do with that? It's in, Seoul, it's in, it's in South Korea. And do you go forward with the Olympic Games? And then I have reports coming to me. And I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, word on the street is war's coming. And it's coming after the Olympics. And I don't know if that means the United States will then launch a preemptive strike. You know, Trump's not going to tell you what he's going to do. He's already told you that. He don't tell you what he's going to do. But it, it can't go on forever. And as he has said and promised, he will take care of this, that it should have been taken care of by the last three administrations. And he can't pass this on to the next one because it's too dangerous now. And the question is, does Kim Jong-un strike first? Does he sense it's coming? And do they, does, does Kim Jong-un fire something right into the Olympic Games? Um, you know, so if this is as dangerous as it gets. Now, I have context, yes. <laughs> People call me all the time. People who work in every government agency in America, employees of the federal government in every agency. I have been contacted by people in every agency who are Christians, who don't give away classified information, never, but they can share what is known and is public, though it's not reported, by your lamestream, mainstream, fake news media. There's a lot of public information that's out there that nobody knows about because your lamestream, mainstream media won't report it. They just gonna tell you about the Russia probe. They're gonna tell you that Rex Tillerson called the president a moron. They're gonna talk about, you know, uh, Jay-Z's baby. Uh, they're gonna keep up with the Kardashians. You know, the, 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 the fake news media. But there's people who are working in the federal government who are born-again Christians. They've, many of them have come to our conferences, to our revivals. Every conference or revival, I usually end up talking to two, at least two, maybe three people who work within the federal government. Some are in the military. Some are in um, Homeland Security. Some are in FEMA. 
Some are in, uh, you know, uh, different departments. And they all just bring up and say, keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, but let me give you just a little nugget here. And it's all stuff that can be found. So what they, they're saying is, you can't, you don't, first of all, countries don't move this much hardware and do nothing. You know how much it costs to move these battleships, to move, deploy all these troops, to get everybody in position if you're getting ready to go to war. It isn't a knee jerk, you know, it isn't a Barack Obama knee jerk reaction where he just fires off a drone and then holds a press conference in the Rose Garden and says, we're going to, we're dealing with ISIS. We got them on the run. They're a junior varsity team. Yeah, really. While they're chopping off heads, raping women, murdering people, bodies piling up in mass graves, taking over towns and cities and villages, and the whole Middle East going to hell in a handbasket. That was Barack Obama. That's exactly what went on. Trump's, here's, here's, here's a different approach. Trump says, you know what? We're going to deal with this. And I'm not going to tell you when or how. And then he goes and gets with his generals and says, guys, tell me exactly what it takes to take care of this problem. I want ISIS crushed. I want them driven out of Mosul. I want them driven out of Iraq. I want them driven out of Syria. Tell me what we got to do. And they tell him and they put it in play and it costs money. But at the end of the day, look at ISIS. Look at ISIS in nine months. They're now little bitty band and they're just about ready to get wiped out. They're Forget it. They're in Iraq, they're just, they've been literally, they're mincemeat in Iraq. And in Syria, they're on the run. And we're not bombing empty warehouses no more. And we trained and we empowered the, the, uh, the governments of Iraq and some of the freedom fighters or whatever they are over in Syria. But at the end of the day, the United, the United States has went to work on ISIS. That's not, that's the truth. But you won't know this. Because of the fake news media that won't tell you what's actually happening. And of course, there were thousands of Christians lost their lives during the slaughter of the Obama administration. And I'm not afraid to say it because the dead bodies are everywhere. Heads were on fence posts all over the place. I, nobody wants to report it. But I'm not afraid to say it because I mean, these are people. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And oh, by the way, the little pansy preachers and some of the fluffy, puffy, cotton candy Christians who don't want to acknowledge that that's your... What guy? Absolutely. There's one preacher in New Jersey. God help him. Help him, Lord. Forgive him. But he preached that the people dying in Syria were not really your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because if they were, they wouldn't be dying. I, I almost puked. I, I almost regurgitated. And this guy preaches to a thousand people every Sunday. Are you serious? Again, God bless them. Help them, Lord. I'm just, re, re, everybody relax. Just calm down. So, you don't, my whole point was this. You just don't go moving battleships and nuclear subs to set up and do nothing. Now, if we can prevent war by setting this all up and point the barrel in Kim Jong-un's direction and then give him one last chance, but he has to know that we're not playing, that when we point it, we're getting ready to pull the trigger and he needs to understand it. And folks, that hour is coming. And when you talk about hours that are coming, you, did you know that Jesus even said, pray that you be worthy, that you escape the hour of temptation that's coming upon the world. You see, that hour is coming. There's an hour coming where the world, the whole world, every human being on this planet will have to make a decision who they're going to serve. Whew. Are you serious? You talk about pressure. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready for that hour? Don't wait to that hour and think you're going to decide to make the right call. Because I can almost tell you as I'm looking into this camera, 
If you can't make the right call right now, what makes you think you're going to make the right call then? Give your life to Jesus Christ. If you can't serve the Lord in a green tree, Jesus said, how can you serve him in a dry? If you can't come to Jesus when the Holy Ghost is moving, when freedom is still yours, when the opportunities to have a successful life in Christ, to be blessed, is right at your fingertips. And for some reason, if you still can't come to Jesus because there's something you're holding on to. Is there something in the world that's more important? Is there something in the world that you just enjoy? Is the sin just too pleasurable? Is there something out there that you can't let go? Because if you can't come to him now, I guarantee you, you're going to have a rough time making that decision in that hour when the whole world bows its knees to the beast. Are you saved? I'm going to raise... I'm going to raise the stakes today. There's over 1,258 people watching live right now. And thank God for every person. I truly care about you. I don't want one of you. I don't want one of you to miss heaven. I don't want you to miss heaven. I'm going to ask you to do something. Make the decision. Make the greatest call of your life. Type in the chat room. Periscope. New live stream. Paul Begley Prophecy and YouTube, four chat rooms. Type, I want to be saved. We're going to play a song. We're going to play a song. Brock, uh, we're going to play a song. Amen. Praise God. Let's, let's do this. Let's get saved. Just type, I want to be saved. I will pray with every person that wants to be saved. I will pray with you. You see, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's do this. Let's get saved. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering. Rain and shame And I love I'll write your name that down cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost Sinners was slain Many people are rededicating right now. Thank you, Melissa. So Crystal, the Pena, and family want to be saved. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. How many more? And exchange it someday for a crown. That old rugged cross. This is your day. So despised. This is your moment. By the world. Choose Jesus and live. As a wondrous. Live abundantly. Attraction for me. Elizabeth Reed wants to be saved. Praise God. For the dear Lamb of God. God. Left his glory Stephen McDonald to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till Faith my true humanity at last I wants to be down. saved. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Ryan Resenberger. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Crystal Pena and family. Elizabeth Reed, Stephen McDonald, Faith in Humanity, 
Ryan Resenberger, all wanting to be saved. Also, Amber wants to be saved. And Dawn wants to be saved. Praise God. And it's Amber Fielding and her mother, Dawn. Okay, praise God. Amen. Amen. Also, follower of Christ wants to be saved. That's the right thing to do. And so does Jonathan. Praise God. Amen. And so does England. Let's play a song, Brock. There's more. There's more. People are on the fence. People are on the fence. It's the old rugged cross. Lamont wants to be saved. You know, the Bible says the preaching of the cross to them that perish. This is foolishness. But to us that are saved, it is the power of God. My Lord, we're talking salvation in the name of Jesus. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering. You can do this. Shame. You can do this. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord and shall love be saved. A Cyan wants to be saved. Also, Eric Wick Wicker wants to be saved. Praise the Lord. Let's get her name written, folks, in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's get born again right here, right now. It's your moment. You own it. Call on the name of Jesus. Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old Also, Chris cross. the Vancura Wants so to be saved. Praise God. By the world has a wondrous Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Help you, folks. Come to Jesus. Me. Help them, Lord. This is the hour. Pamela Roy wants oh, to be saved. Oh, praise the Lord. Lamb of God left his glory above. How many more? How many more? Dark Calvary. I'm gonna cherish the old rugged cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Make that decision today. Make that decision today. Crown, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Folks, we're going to pray right now. We have 16 names. We have Crystal Pena and family, Elizabeth Reed, Stephen McDonald, Faith and Humanity, and Ryan Reisenberger and Amber Fielding, and Dawn, and follow, follower of Christ, and Jonathan, and England, and Lamont, and Cy N, and Eric Wickert, and Chris the Vancura, and Pamela Roy, 16 that we know of, and I believe there's others that are listening by radio, or iPhones, uh, or thousands of you that have watched this on the archives. Some of you right now want to be saved. I want you to pray with me. I might not be live, but Jesus is always live. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm repent. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm repenting of my sins and I'm calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm asking Christ to forgive me. 
I'm confessing my sins to God. And I'm asking Jesus of Nazareth to deliver me, to wash me, to cleanse me from all my sins. I'm opening my heart's door. And I'm asking Christ to come into my life and not only just save me, but to turn my life around, to put me on a solid foundation. I want to have life and have it more abundantly. I want to be blessed going in and blessed going out. I want my children blessed. I want my husband blessed. I want my wife blessed. I want my life blessed. I want to live victoriously in Christ. So I'm asking Jesus. I'm surrendering. And I'm bowing to you. I renounce the devil. I, I, I come against Satan. And I cling to the cross. Because I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God, and that he rose from the dead. Jerry also wants to be saved. I believe that Jesus ascended into heaven. And that he's coming back again. And I want to be ready. So right here, right now, by faith, in God's grace, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, I am saved, 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 healed. I'm delivered. Chains are gone. My life has changed. I've been saved. In Jesus' precious name, somebody shout! Are you serious? Let's clap our hands. Here we go. A little Kevin Copley for you. Was holding this way. All my night was turned to day. Seventeen. When my friends don't understand. Oh, while I'm singing to clap my hands. I clap my hands and clap my hands Oh, everybody ought to clap your hands Yeah, well, clap your hands, clap your hands Also, Robert and everybody Tulsa rededicated clap your hands. Yeah, let everybody clap well, your clap hands Well, clap your hands, clap your hands Look the devil in the eye and clap your hands yeah. Clap your hands, clap your hands Oh, everybody ought to clap your hands The angels are rejoicing When the enemy comes like a flood You tell him I'm covered by the blood Oh yeah You let him know your chains can you stand Clap your hands, clap your hands Oh, everybody, everybody ought to clap your hands Yeah, come on In the name of Jesus, that devil's got to go. You let him know your whole God. Oh, yes. Oh, just everybody ought to clap your hands. Finish that song. What? <laughs> yeah. Everybody ought to clap your hands. Ah, uh, yes, that's Kevin Copley. And uh, clap your hands. 
Uh, we had 17 people have given their life to Jesus Christ that we know of in the chat rooms live. And I'm excited. There were 19 last night. You know, God is setting the captive free. Whom the Son of Man makes free is free indeed. You don't just get set free. You get made free. Oh, come on, somebody. I mean, you could set somebody free and they're still stumble and bumble and fumble their way into the darkness. But when you make somebody free, they're no longer just a released prisoner. They're an empowered individual. All right. Praise God. Wait a minute. I'm missing something. Am I, have I, I've got something messed up a little bit here. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Thank you, Brock. All right. All right. Now, uh, let me just say quickly, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. The angels are rejoicing in heaven and they're shouting on the golden streets of glory. All right. Is that my home? No. I said, you know what it was? I had this in my ear. You can't sing with that double. It's like this. Is that the light of my home I see? Do I feel a breeze from the crystal sea? Is that my Lord standing high on heaven's balcony? If that's the lights of my home, it's a welcome sight to me. Oh, yes. Praise God. Let me just tell you, some of you need to know that your mansion is being built in heaven. Now, I would encourage you to get baptized. Find a pastor, find a church somewhere in the community where you live and tell them, look, I got saved. I got born again. And I want to be baptized, all right? I want to be baptized. And so, praise God. It's a death burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you need help finding a church or a Messianic congregation or a pastor, you know what? You can send an email to converts.2016 at gmail.com. That's converts.2016 at gmail.com. And Dr. Rosa will help you find uh, a church or a Messianic congregation or pastor to baptize you. If you need a Bible, we'll send you one right now. Send an email to zd one at hotmail.com. That's zd one at hotmail.com. Or just go to our website at paulbegleyprophecy.com. This is the easiest way. And just click on the prayer wall and type your name, address, and you're requesting a Bible. And we'll send it to you. It's free. And we'll pay the postage and get it to you. And same thing if you're sick. I'll pray over one of these prayer cloths. We'll anoint it with oil in the name of the Lord. And we'll send it to you for free. Now, just a piece of cloth. It does have healing scriptures on it. But it is a piece of cloth that's in obedience to what they did in the days of the early church. When they would take pieces of cloth, uh, off, uh, handkerchiefs and off of the clothing of Paul. They would just take pieces of cloth. They would anoint it with oil. And they would send it and say, take it to the sick. Because Paul couldn't go everywhere. Neither can this Paul go everywhere. So we would send it by faith. We'll pay the postage and get it to you for free. No matter where you are in the world. Also, there are some that are very, very ill. And may need us to anoint a prayer blanket. Or if someone's going to... Keep Cancer, they have cancer, they're going through chemotherapy. We'll anoint a prayer cap that they can wear. It's anointed and prayed over. Believe in God for your healing in Jesus' name. We couldn't do this, but we can do this because of our faithful partners of, of the Paul Bigley Prophecy Ministries. Seriously, this amazing online church of believers that are standing faithful and uh, been faithful. You know what the Bible says? If you're faithful over a few things, I'll make you a ruler over many. Uh, the, a lot of reasons folks wonder why that, you know, I don't understand God. I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do. Do the things he already told you to do. Start with the, those things and then let him see your, see your commitment, see your faithfulness. And he'll say, hey, I can bless this person. A little more here. I can put more responsibility on them a little more because I know I can count on them. 
This is huge, folks. It's just a few things. And really it is. So we just praise God for that. One of those few things is being faithful, of course, in your giving. And so many of you are the, your tithers. You know, God's already blessing you. You already know it. The Bible says that he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. You won't have room to contain it. Or we have people that are giving offerings. And today you might want to give an offering. You know what? Let's take five minutes and give people a chance to, to give an offering today. Take five more minutes and we'll pray in five minutes. Even though this ain't Friday. Is this Thursday, right? Even though I just feel led of the Lord to do this. So I'm going to do this. So uh, as you give, the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Okay. And uh, the Lord is so good. You know, he said in the Bible that he would supply every need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Look, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> So, you know, he, he can do, he can do exceedingly abundantly greater than you ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. So we praise God. You know, we put things before the Lord. We ask God, lead us, direct us, show us what to do. And, uh, God then says, here's what I want you to do. And I always say, well, God, how in the world am I going to do that? And he always says, you just start it and I'll provide. These are the simple things I ask you to do. Let me tell you the first thing, you know, I mean, I got called to preach. I, many times he said, do this, do this, preach here, go there, do that. And uh, God would always move and make it, make it happen just miraculously. But when he told me to open the computer, I had a rickety old uh, laptop. It was like, Five years old. It didn't have any memory left. This was in 2010. And uh, th this is before laptops had cameras. So I had this little rickety webcam. Remember those things that are kind of round? It looked like an alien or something. You stuck it on there. And he said, I want you to get a cup of coffee. And I want you to get your Bible. And I want you to pray. And then I want you to turn that computer on. And I want you to look into that camera and I want you to imagine a thousand people and you talk to them about what's going on in this world and show them how it relates to the biblical prophecies in the Bible. I said, God, I'm not even, I'm not, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't even know what, what, what I'm doing here. I don't even know how to turn the thing on. What's YouTube? I've heard about it, but I don't even know what it is. And when I did find out how to turn on the computer. And then when I went to YouTube, all these people were jumping off buildings and dyeing their hair green. And, and I thought, what? He said, that's exactly where I want you right there. And just start talking to these people and start sharing the truth. And I'll anoint you and, and, and I'll save people. You just stand there. I'll just be faithful over a few things. And in this case, three things, get a cup of coffee. Thank God. Get a Bible, thank God, and open the computer. Now, some of you today, God may be asking you to just do a few things. A th maybe one thing. Maybe it's just something small. Whatever it is, talk to a neighbor about Jesus. Share one of my YouTube videos on the Facebook page you have. Uh, you know, pray. Uh, whatever God is, speaks, just obey the Lord. And if he is speaking to you to give, then please give today. And don't worry about what it is. Or if you don't have it, you know, just wait on the Lord. But today, be obedient. We're going to pray. I'm, I feel like praying over uh, the offering today. And I'll do it again tomorrow, as I always do. But this is Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a time of just whew, reflecting and praying and worshiping. And, and uh, I, you know, look, every day is a great day with Jesus. Okay? Every day. But I like to look at the biblical... Uh, times of feast times and I like to really thank God for what he did for all of us in Jesus name father in the name of Jesus bless your people some are sick Lord need to be healed heal them Lord in Jesus name and bless them Lord today lift that spirit of heaviness and give them the spirit of praise and Lord we have no fear 
You didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. You told us to go forth and uh, you would make us kings and priests, royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people in Christ Jesus. Bless those that are giving today. Bless those, Lord, that have it to give and those that don't have it. Bless them, Lord. Thank you, Father, that there's obedience and we worship you. We thank you, we praise you, and we lift your name higher. And we want to always praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And amen and amen. God bless you. I'll see you guys tonight, Lord willing, 10 p.m. prime time, live, 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 live. Available from Paul Begley, his CD, Wayfaring Stranger. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world be Wayfaring Stranger includes the title cut plus 11 other songs. No Order yours by visiting paulbegleyprophecy.com today. A brand new DVD, Zombie Apocalypse 2. I sat down with L.A. Marzulli and got a first-hand account from Pastor Casper McLeod. This DVD deals with the demonic spirits manifesting in the world today. The zombie craze has certainly caught the eye of Hollywood and movies and TV series. But do you really know what it is? Get the DVD. It's at my website right now. A brand new book I've just finished called Reflections from the Land of the Prophets. This book is filled with beautiful pictures, a pictorial, if you will, of the Holy Land and some definite great insight to the prophets that once spoke mightily in the times leading us up to the present. It's a prophetic word, a reflection of what God has spoken, not only historically from the past, but for the future. Go to my website. It's available now. Thank you so much for watching the broadcast. I really appreciate it. And I'll tell you something. If you'd like to know more about some of our books that we've written, go to our website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. That's www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. I've even got music CDs. I actually have a couple country gospel music CDs that we recorded that I think you'll really enjoy. I have five books that I've written. This is my newest one, Jerusalem Jihad. Jerusalem Jihad. This has to do about an end time apocalyptic scenario that includes the rebuilding of the temple, also uh, the two witnesses, and uh, it's a powerful presentation, if you will, on how things are starting to come together here in the last days. So again, check out all of our books, uh, CDs, and everything else we have, and your donations are greatly appreciated at our website. God bless you, in Jesus' name.